I think it's all working now. So, Great. hello everybody. Welcome to episode 63. I'm just going to check something real quick to make sure that I'm not totally insane. But we'll be starting here in just a moment, I think. Yes. It is working. All right, good. If you're in the con if you're in the audience, you've somehow made it through the mix. I'm super proud of you. Like, nice job. Because yeah, this is very complex. <laughs> yeah, we so. we ran into a, quite a few technical difficulties uh, trying to do this episode. I think I see what happened. I think basically, so we're getting ready for the EBPF summit, as you know, mm -hmm. for next week. Yeah, and there was some like testing that was being done to validate that YouTube was working for that. And then they, in, in the process, I think they inadvertently used the um, YouTube link that was set up for this episode. Mm -hmm. And so there was already a recording and YouTube doesn't let you like get away with that business. It's like, you know, if you're either, you're either doing the YouTube thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? Yeah. You're either doing the YouTube thing like once you've set the recording time, the rec that is the recording. And if you try to, um, if you try to grab a hold of that, then it will get messed up. I see. So let me see if I can find your videos. Give me one sec live. So this is the correct one. Get shareable link, and then I can put that in the notes. Yeah, it was like a, so you, you ran into that YouTube problem and then my computer just totally froze. I think I ran out of memory because I don't ever close any of my tabs. Ah. And uh, I'd also just updated the kernel like yesterday. And so I think everything was just like, nope, I'm done. That's all I got. Yep. So, so uh, yeah, uh, I had to do a quick reboot. <laughs> nice. So I've just replied to your tweet with the YouTube link. Okay. Now, and then I'm going to do a tweet, episode 63. I'm going to delete this one. And then... All right, tweet, and then if we can get this retweeted. Copy link to tweet, just tweet this. Do, 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 and then pow. Oh. Ah, the joys of live streaming yeah. hey man other than you know this stuff yeah it's always fun okay. okay i got it all figured out now i am about to kick into episode mode so cool pause that and then we will go back to Streamyard. wherever i put Streamyard, there it should be um we've been live by the way Yep. Yeah, they're getting to watch me like figure this all out. <laughs> how it works. Sometimes, sometimes we are the hero that we. Sometimes you know we get the hero we we want rather than the yeah. Hero. All right, everybody. I have some really interesting stuff this week. I am doing um, an episode covering UPF Recorder, which is a tool that lets you understand what Cilium is doing your packets so that should be fun we're going to yeah. get that one here in just a minute now i'm just going to wipe out my notes here and then share my desktop and then we can start our episode as we normally would all right here we go and dang it nick just went away again all right well maybe he'll come back share screen screen one share and he's back i'm back sorry i clicked the wrong link <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Out of the recorder. All right. So next week is EVPF Summit 2022. It will be hosted by a number of people that you've seen on this show. Myself, Liz Rice. We're going to have um, Tracy also hosting. There's going to be a ton of great content. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, you can go to the link 
Hey, Rich. Wow. We have audience members. It's so good to see you. I know. It's crazy. Wacky, <laughs> wacky process. I'm glad uh, you're here. Finally. Things are going wanna, right. Yeah. If you want, you can register for the event here, and you can also join our Summit Slack, and you can ask questions of the folks who are giving talks and all that wonderful stuff. But this is basically what we're going to be talking about all next week. Um, well, not all next week, basically Wednesday and Thursday. But Wednesday yeah. and Thursday should be really a lot, a lot of great talks, and it'll be a lot of fun to do. I'm actually flying to Zurich tomorrow, <laughs> and I will be, I'm like doing an overnight flight, so I'll be time traveling, and then I'll be there for a week working from the Zurich office, doing all of that stuff, and then... Um, I'll be coming back like the week after. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be a lot of fun. I think that'll be really, really cool to be in the office with everyone doing the EBPF stuff. Yeah. Well, wait, last time we totally did it virtual and I was doing it from like right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, that makes sense. But aren't you turning right around and then going to KubeCon as well? KubeCon's not until October. That's, I mean, but come on. <laughs> That's like right like the end, Like the end of October. I have oh, like okay. days. I thought it was. I thought it was like the 15th or something like that. No, it's almost Halloween. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> spooky hey, Eric. yay rich is joining us and eric is here and marco is here and ma it's good to see you all i'm glad you're here thanks for joining wow. us everyone all right so other things we have echo news if you want to subscribe to echo news you can go to isavalent.com or you can subscribe and then this is a bunch of uh you know kind of written in this very similar style to some of the other blog posts that are out there it's core it's put together by <clears throat> by Bill, and we talk and we talk about the different things that are happening. So, porting an eBPF based, based program to ARM sixty four, our experience with Inspector Gadget, basically making Inspector Gadget so that it can work on multiple platforms. That was kind of a fun one, probably a really interesting talk, because I know that when it comes down to like the different system calls and things like that that a system can make, um, you would think that there would be like a really consistent API for that, right? That that would mm -hmm. like this function would be that API call and that would be how it works regardless of the platform. But no, that's not the case. It's actually unique per platform. So it's unique for Arch64, it's unique for AMD64, it's unique for, for each of them. I know this I know this because like when I was digging into the whole SecCom profile thing, this was a this was part of the interesting part of the challenge was that if you're gonna buy if you're gonna write a SecCom profile, you have to write it for the platform and the application that you're targeting, which is interesting. That is interesting. And you know, it does make sense a bit um, that you would have to have these different calls for different architectures, right? They're different architectures, right? <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of complexity, but that is very interesting. Yeah, funny. And then we have an introduction to eBPF part one. Talks about where it came from, what it came to, or what it was about. Oh, nice. Actually, so it's kind of giving a nice, like, 201 version of it, like how it works. You're going to write a eBPF program, compile one, battle with the verifier, make things happen. Nice. Yeah. And then there's a chat about how Cilium has a rather high entry threshold, but it is powerful and handy tool that can that adds many useful features to cluster management. All this makes Cilium a fascinating project and worth paying attention to. Interesting. I wonder why the under why the high entry threshold. We've been doing a lot of work to try and lower that entry threshold, but I guess it'll be interesting to see. I think I wonder if it's like all the knobs and things like that, right? There's a lot of like configuration that goes into Cilium and the ways that you can customize your own, you know, data plane and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, all the various pieces, Hubble and uh, Tetragon on top of it. That maybe gives the impression that it's, you know. A uh, complex barrier to entry to, to something to another CNI, for example, like something like a Calico that you know it's kind of just plug and play a bit. Mm -hmm. I could see that, but uh, you know, obviously, with any amount of complexity comes a great deal of power as well. It's true. Yeah, sometimes. So next week, <clears throat> the events that are coming up is obviously the EBVF Summit, but there is also EBVF Summit Watch Party. So if you're in Europe, you can actually check, you can catch us in Berlin, Lausanne, Tel Aviv, or Zurich in our in, in the office. If you're in Zurich, definitely come by and say hello. Um, I'll be there with Liz and Tracy, as I said, and I'm sure that um, a bunch of other a bunch of other awesome folks will be around as well. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're up to in the news this week. 
I like this quote from uh, Dave Tucker. EBPF is eating the kernel. Software <laughs> is eating the world, and EBPF is eating the kernel. All right. So next up, we are going to be exploring a feature of Cilium that is called Recorder. And what this does, this is actually, so this, the original idea behind Recorder here was to make it so that you could get a PCAP or a, a packet capture of traffic moving through um, the XDP layer to allow, to allow you to actually uh, understand what's happening at that layer. Because if, you, if, you, if you've been looking into like XDP at all, the way that XDP works, XDP stands for Accelerated Data Paths. And the way that XDP works is that in the kernel layer, right, where the kernel and the driver exist, um, down way above the user space in, in, in environment, when a packet comes into the network interface, XDP gives us the ability to take that packet and figure out like where we're going to, you know, we can write a data path for like how we want to actually make that, that next hop happen. And we can actually take that packet right off of the network interfaces buffer and put it directly into the socket that the receiving application is. Would receive it as right. So when trap when you're using like say node port or load balancer or some kind of load balancer technician or technique where you're actually like routing traffic from outside the cluster into a given application, the way that this could happen is that when that traffic is attracted to the node where it's going to where an application exists, then as the traffic comes into the node, XDP would grab that packet and then accelerate it basically straight to the application. Which is awesome because we can, you know, bypass a bunch of like jumps back and forth between user space and kernel space as we navigate the routing table or whatever, because we already know where the two endpoints are. So we can just make the jump. We can make a shortcut uh, between the actual physical interface and the application that would be receiving this traffic. The downside is that when we do that, right, that means that in eBPF we can write a load balancing mechanism that says when this traffic comes in, right. So we're going to like replace Q proxy here, for example. When the traffic comes into the cluster, it would normally hit that service implementation. And then that service implementation, sometimes in IP tables, sometimes in IPVS, if you're using existing Q proxy techni techniques, that service implementation would determine a healthy endpoint on the back end and then route that traffic to that healthy endpoint. So the traffic would come in, it would hit the node. The node would hit would, would see that the destination of this traffic is a service IP. We would make the decision about which of the backend healthy pods we're going to route that traffic to. And then we would manipulate the packet if we're using IPVS or, or, or IP tables. We manipulate the packet to set the destination of this packet to whatever that healthy endpoint is. And then we let that traffic through. That's how it would work without XDP and without BPF. With XDP and with BPF, it works a little bit differently. Instead of actually coming in and hitting IP tables and IPVS, the traffic comes in. We pull that traffic. We pull that traffic off of the buffer. We see that it's destined for a cluster IP, right, or a uh, or, an, or or node port or what have you. And then we we make the decision in an eBPF program which endpoint to make that destination to, and we do all of that manipulation that NAT in eBPF, right? And that way when the packet traverses, and then at that point we can make the decision like, are we doing XDP or are we not doing XDP? So if we're doing XDP, then we can actually just then shortcut this directly to the application. If we're not doing XDP, then we can allow for the traffic to be routed however it would normally be routed toward, uh, toward that pod. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's like a really convenient way to circumvent a lot of like extra steps as you're saying. Uh, to make a decision. That's really cool. This is something that I very, know very little about. <laughs> so. Yeah. So to enable this was a little bit tricky and I wanted to talk about like what this is. So if we go to XDP, so there's actually a bunch of really great stuff in here about XDP on the docs.cilium.io website. If you're interested in understanding more about what XDP is and how it works, there have been some great texts here. There have been, there's also some talks about um, EBPF in the newscast, there's, you know, podcasts, there's a bunch of information here of kind of about like what it is and how it works. And then um, 
if we go to oh, XTP, PPF and XTP reference guide, this actually also gets into architecture, how it works, like functionally, those sorts of things, which I think is very useful to read if you're interested in learning more about it. But node ports. We also have this page, which is really where we're going to start. Right. So this page talks about load balancer and node port XTP acceleration. And a lot of what I just covered is documented right here in this in this page. So I'm just going to copy this over to our notes and then you can see the notes there. Oh, hey, look at that. It's already there. <laughs> Wacky. <laughs> so um, if you want to read more about this, then you can do this. But basically, the uh, um, where this topic starts is in a feature of Cilium wherein we can actually replace Kube proxy. So when the decision is being made, or you know, like when your application inside of your Kubernetes cluster or outside of your Kubernetes cluster sends a packet toward a service, that routing decision about which of the healthy endpoints of a service to make, we can actually make that decision in eBPF if you use Cilium's Kube proxy free mode, where basically we replace Kube proxy. You just would never deploy it in your Kubernetes cluster and Cilium can handle that part of the work. And this document talks about an advanced functionality of Cilium. We can do this with or without XDP. It's not a requirement that you have XDP turned on to run without Kube proxy. Right? It's not a right. requirement that you do that. So, yeah, that's kind of the yeah. default cube proxy replacement is not with XDP. You need a special driver for that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that was actually where it was interesting for me, but we're going to get there in a second. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, I might be jumping a little bit ahead. <laughs> no, it's all right. So to your point, like XDP can be, and can be achieved, XDP acceleration can be achieved in a number of interesting ways. One of the ways it can be achieved is actually that you have a set there are a set of um, network interfaces that uh, that actually support XTP natively. And that's covered down here, right? So these network interfaces, the Amazon ENA, the Broadcom BNX TEN, there's a KVM NIC, there's Freescale NIC, there's a bunch of Intel NICs that support it. <clears throat> there's a bunch of NICs out here that actually support it. And this one turns out to be the one we're going to be using. For Dionet. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually far more than I thought. Right. There's a ton of NICs here that actually support native uh that, that support native XDP on these NICs. And then they also say when XDP support was was created for them, right? So in the 410 kernel. So if you're using like a, a hypervisor, like if you're using uh lib kvm or libvert and you wanted to actually play with xdp make an xdp playground or something mm -hmm. then as long as you're forward of 4.10 then you can use the vert io network interface as an, a native xdp enabled nick and then you can actually play with this stuff which is what i'm doing and we're going to talk about my setup here in a second maz has a question in case of xdp load balancer the traffic will not go via the cpu it will go forward directly to the target backend. Correct. That's correct. Which if you're playing along, you might uh, start to realize why we need something like a BPF recorder for yeah. this scenario. And because that traffic is actually being picked right off the NIC and sent directly at the kernel layer over to the application that is the destination, that means that that traffic isn't really viewable in uh, standard tools like TCP dump. The routing decision that we made isn't like clearly isn't clearly viewable mm -hmm. when, when when we're using XDP, right? Because we're bypassing like Netlink and all those other things, right? Yeah, yeah, wild. Yeah, this is really wild. This is really cool. So, so that's kind of the setup, and now I want to talk about like how we're going to be testing this stuff and the environment that I set up to make to kind of play with this stuff. And then we're going to be exploring it together. And if you have questions, feel free to jump drop them in the chat, um, or just say hi. You know, we're here for it. All right. So I have a 
I have a four node cluster and I have Cilium already installed. And I want to talk about like the way I went about configuring Cilium because it is kind of interesting in the way that I had to en enable it, right? So what I did was I brought up a Kubernetes cluster without any cube proxy enabled. So if I were to do get pod stash A and I look around, we can see that cube proxy is not running on this node. And this is just a basic kubeadm based cluster and we're running Cilium and, and pretty much nothing else, right? So there's very few pods running on this cluster. We have Cilium running and we have the Cilium operator. We have our core DNS pods. We have one controller manager, one API server, one etcd code, one scheduler. So not high availability. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> and then in our installation, in our installation, this is actually not the command I used to do the install. Looks more like this. I want to copy all of this over to the back of D. So in this installation, basically what I'm doing I'm doing an ing I'm doing a Helm install of Cilium in the Cil in the Cube System namespace. I'm installing version 1.12.2 off of the Cilium Cilium Helm Helm repo, and I'm doing a couple of different things just to kind of enable this functionality. So first, I'm not going to run in any kind of tunneled mode. So I'm not going to use VXLAN. I'm not going to use Geneve. I'm going to set this auto direct node routes to true, which basically makes it so that there is a route installed in each node that allows for it to understand where the pod cider for each of the other nodes is. I'm going to do cube proxy replacement strict, which enables, which tells Cilium that I want Cilium to replace all of the functionality of cube proxy. So node port, host port, load balance, I mean, not load balancer, node port, host port, um, cluster IP, all of those yeah. things. I want Q, I want Cilium to do all of those things. I'm going to set the load balancer acceleration, and I had set this to native not generic. This generic thing was a test. So it's actually running in native and we're going to take a look at that here in a second. I've set the load balancer mode to hybrid and I've set, and then because I'm running in Q proxy replacement mode, I have to tell Cilium how to reach the API server because there is no Q proxy that would allow Cilium to interact, right? Cilium is going to be the Q proxy. So you have this chicken and egg problem. Yeah. How many times have I run into that? Oh yeah, you and me both. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also have to pass this parameter, which basically says that the cider that I'm going to use for all of my pods is the 10 slash 8 cider. And that basically informs this functionality, the auto direct node routes, to say that this is the cider that I want to route basically back and forth between the nodes. Okay, so that's the install. Looks like we have a question from Rich. How do you do packet captures? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, because like it's kind of invisible at some point. Well, with normal, well, if like using... if you're not using XTP, it should be just normal, right? Normal packet capture should work, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if I do like, in fact, if I were just to do, how I know, uh, kind create cluster. and I just do a Cilium install in here, then we're still using BPF to make some decisions, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you can just use TCP dump to see the traffic that's moving back and forth. So I'm gonna let this start up while this is happening. And then I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna keep going with this other environment. So these are our, our four nodes. I think it'll get nodes dash O wide. And we're running a 5.15 kernel, which is forward of that kernel that we need for the vert IO network interface. And if I were to SSH into any of these nodes, I do east tool dash I east zero. You can see that this is vertio net and it's running version 1.000, which is good. And then the question becomes like, can we determine if Cilium is installed in a way that allows for XTP acceleration? So let's take a look at that. If I do an exec 
into one of the pods. Use psyllium status. <clears throat> Verbose. And so this is the psyllium status. Oh, dang it. I should, that's not going to work. OK, well, <laughs> just do kind master. That later. So this is the status for this particular node. And it gives us a lot of information about what psyllium thinks of the world and how it's configured, right? One of our important steps is this one here. It tells us that we're running in cube proxy strict mode, which means that psyllium is replacing cube proxy. It's replacing all of the functionality of cube proxy. And then down here a little further. We have proxy status. So this is the information for um, cube proxy replacement. So we can see that we have socket LB enabled, that we have status strict, that we're socket LB for TCP and UDP based protocols. We'll talk about socket LB here in a second. The backend selection is random. Session affinity is enabled. Graceful termination is enabled. NAT 4664, if you're using IPv6 and you need NAT functionality, we do support it, but it's disabled by default. And then this is the big impressive line right here. So this means that if you're running in XTP acceleration native, then you'll be able to make use of this um, of this uh, Cilium record or Cilium recorder functionality. Without running in XTP acceleration native, the Cilium recorder functionality is not going to work because where we're hooking in for the PCAP is right there at that XTP interface. Mm -hmm. And then down here, we're actually seeing those services. When we say cube proxy replacement, these are each the component that we're replacing with that cube proxy would normally handle. Yeah. And isn't like cube proxy replacement hybrid? Like it'll do some of them, but not all of them. Like it has to make like a, you have to kind of so tell it which ones you want to use. So there's probe and probe will determine like which version or like what it can actually support and what it can't support. And I think that's actually being phased out eventually. Yeah. Um, and then there's also uh, strict and then there's, um, I think probe is kind of the default at the moment. Yeah, I think the probe is the default. Yeah. And then there's none if you just want to use cube proxy for whatever reason. Yeah, for all of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. So that basically means that we have a driver on the host side on this particular host that enabled that supports XTP acceleration. If our network interface driver did not support it, then we wouldn't see this at all. This would not work. Now, uh, IP link. <clears throat> In fact, we can already see since we're doing an IP link. Um, show de device for E0, we can see that there is a program attached at the network interface line, right? So this program already exists because Cilium is actually doing XTP acceleration. We injected an XTP program on that network interface, and that's actually our hook point for getting traffic off of that thing and making it so that we can send it to our backend pods. Makes perfect sense. Does Hubble identify X, I, XDP accelerated backends if enabled, or is the VPF recorder the only way? Hubble observability works in either case, but Hubble observability is only giving you the ability to understand the perspective from the perspective of Hubble what's happening. And Hubble isn't a PCAP, right? Hubble does show you like what's being connected to what, and it does show you like you know uh, from an identity perspective what things are connecting and not connecting, but it doesn't give you the ability to see a PCAP. I mean, it does. We're going to talk about there here in a second as well. But like, functionally, like that's the the PCAP, the ability, the ability to take a look at what's actually happening at the at the at the packet layer. That's a different functionality than Hubble. But it is a good question, and the question I have is: Did I enable Hubble? Because I probably should have. Nope. <laughs> 
By the way, you might have missed it, but uh, Marcus in chat is our friend Jed. That's just his what? handle. That's right. Ah, uh, sneaky. You know, Marcus, and now you know Jed is now a YouTuber. I don't know if you saw that. Jed's a YouTuber now. Yeah. What? He actually he did a bunch of work on the um. He did a bunch of work on this latest chain guard announcement, and like recorded a bunch of stuff in there. I'll have to look. Jed, if you need a uh, sidekick, I'm always <laughs> up for sidekick roles. That would be awesome. Upgrade. There we go. That's what I use to do the install. And then I'm also going to enable... One second here. You're just enabling a hub right now. Yes, I am. Are you looking for the uh, command? I think it's hubble.enabled true. I believe that, yes, that is correct. Okay. But I can also verify that for you. Enabled, sorry, enabled with a D. And now that should deploy Hubble. Put in there. You would think that would come up by now. Yeah. No, I, I, somebody hit me with one that I thought was absolutely hilarious the other day. It was um, my friend uh, Hart. <laughs> <laughs> he said that he pointed out that like um, Helm does a thing where it fails successfully. Yes. Yeah, it does, I, doesn't it? I love the whole idea of failing, <laughs> of, of failing successfully, right? Because. You'll notice that when I made that parameter change, right? Likely, what mm -hmm. happened was that that particular function, that particular call is not the that's not the right Helm point. Go up to your command again. Yeah, one second. You might need to do. Oh no, you do an upgrade. Okay, upgrade install. Da, 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 da. Set Hubble dot enabled equals true. No, that's true. I got that right. Okay. Mm. The joys of Hubble. This isn't even about Hubble. This is about Helm. I know. <laughs> yeah. Or I meant not. Sorry, I meant Helm, not Hubbles. <laughs> That's the second time of the week I've done that. Where, where I'm reading something and it just takes over. Hubble enabled true. Oh. That's what I need. So that just enables Hubble. But what I need is a relay. Oh, I thought that was on by default. I'm gonna be honest. So there we go. Hubble dot relay. Yeah, 
You might want to set both. Yes, Hubble's on Hubble, Hubble's on by default. No. To your point. Now we can do cube kettle get pause dash and cube system. There we go. Hubble relay. Cool. We can do cube kettle. Got this really cool trick. When don't you? Hey, but do you know that we have a Hubble client that can be deployed as a pod? I mean, I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. I learned about this recently also, which is pretty handy because then it means you can actually use. There we go. Perfect. So this means that you can deploy Hubble as a client inside of mm -hmm. whatever database you want to target and then set the Hubble server parameter to point toward the Hubble relay service. And then you'd be able to interact with Hubble inside the cluster. So you don't have to actually have Hubble locally. You could just deploy it in the cluster. That's really cool. Cool system. And then there is our Hubble client running. And then if we do kubectl exec ti, Bash and cube system. Hubble bash. Hubble status. You can see all our four nodes, and then we mm -hmm. do Hubble observe. And, I don't know, cube system. You can see traffic moving back and forth. OK. Yep. Let's move on to the next step here. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually deploy um, I'm going to deploy a service inside of this namespace, and then I'm going to expose it via node port, and then I'm going to send some traffic to it. And then we're going to start playing games with, like, can we see the traffic? Where can we see the traffic? That kind of stuff. Sounds good. OK. So to do that, I think I actually have some manifests in here that I want. Phi dash F. Oh, pinger. Get GC. Perfect. It's already node port. Okay. So if I do a curl, you get all get you get all get nodes wide. And I'm gonna just kind of grab one of these IPs from the worker set, and we'll do export worker equals uh, e, so we know what that is, and then we can do curl. And then the port three one five one three. Oop. And we can also test this out visually by going to one nine. Actually, leave the, see the notes there. We'll go one nine two one six eight two hundred dot twenty thirty one colon three one two one three. Is it? Wow, it's a lot of HTML. Okay. Yeah. Should have done like silent or something. 31513. Oh, really? Okay, fine. 92168. 201. And then the, the port is 31513. Hey, hey, also John Harris says hello in chat. Hey, John. Come on. <laughs> my, my one feedback to you, Jed, I, I love the video and I loved how you presented it. But like, I mean, your hook has got to be that you just have to do all of your YouTube videos like outside with big, beautiful mountains behind you. And, and then yeah, you, I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> and then you... And then you just have to like record the audio someplace else. But like you would just be out there like in the beautiful outdoor outdoors, recording yourself, making the presentation gestures and talking about it, and then just overlap the the voice some other time because that way you can be heard and also be in nature, which I know is a big part of who you are. So 
Can you imagine doing that, like doing a hike and just like walking and talking like this and then having to do the like ADR later? I love that. That'd be the way to do it. All right. So here we are. This is an acceler. This is, this is using XDP to get the traffic into this um, application. So I'm using a node port and this traffic is being accelerated to get into the node. Um, and it's pretty hard to really tell, you know, that this is accelerated traffic because it really just looks like any of the traffic. From our perspective, we're just interacting with the application from outside. Oh, yes, that would have been plus one. <laughs> that is the thing you must do. Oh, my God. That's the hook. I mean, that's, if you want to be I mean, a YouTuber, that's, that's what will attract people to your YouTube your YouTubeness. Well, I mean, the great content and the uh, charming personality already is What's a fantastic content? hook. That's, that's next yeah, level. Right next there. level, yeah. All right. So we have our accelerated traffic. Let's take a look at what this traffic looks like when we're looking at Hubble Observe. So Hubble, uh, let's see, cube kettle, exec ti dash n cube system, Hubble. Hubble Observe, dash n default. So now we're following traffic we see some traffic moving back and forth within all of the components, and that's because of mm -hmm. the way Goldfinger works, right? So this is traffic moving back and forth um, between all of the individual components inside the cluster or inside of the um, deployment here, basically checking to see if they can reach each other. Yeah, I got a question, actually. I don't know what Goldfinger is. Oh, so let's talk about Goldfinger real quick. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's OK. I like this thing. This is really neat, actually. Mm -hmm. What Goldfinger is, is it can be deployed in a number of different ways. It can be deployed as a daemon set or as a deployment. And it um, and the application itself presents this UI. This What's happening behind the scenes is that each individual host, right? Each individual mm -hmm. component or each individual endpoint in this entire set is making a set of queries or making a set of queries. The first is to determine all of the endpoints that are known within the namespace or within that particular search criteria, mm -hmm. and then to establish, a, a effectively do a curl, like a, a an HTTP ping between all of the components. I see, okay. So for every endpoint, I have results about whether that endpoint can reach the host IP of the other side and the pod IP of the other side. Oh, nice. And whether they, and whether they were successful. Oh, that gives you a lot of data. Perfect for a demonstration like this. Yeah. And so this basically shows me like the, from this Goldpinger node, I can. these are the other ones that I'm able to reach. And then they also show they have a metrics endpoint. So if you wanted to scrape this with Prometheus, that's in there. And so you could have something like this that basically shows that you have known good connectivity between all of the components of the cluster. If you're using it as a daemon set, you kind of know that because there's one of these on every node. And if you're mm -hmm. using deployment, then you're doing more of a kind of a scale testing model, right? Right. So I'm doing both. And that's why you see a name. The name of the pod is like the deployment pattern. And then some of the pods have more like the daemon set pattern. Oh, OK, OK. OK. And then they also have this tool, which pretty neat. This is like a heat map showing you kind of like the milliseconds and threshold. Right now, everything's being re able to reach everything with no problems. And that's great. Yeah. But what we wanted to see was traffic moving back and forth from outside. So how do we detect? So that's going to be this traffic here, really. But like, mm -hmm. let's do this. Do. Um,
do from and what I need is from service. I feel like I'm missing something. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to determine that tra traffic coming from an identity. And I know that we have an uh, from identity model. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it's not showing up for me. There's from and to. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. Oh, identity. There it is. Got it. Okay. Did we both just miss it? <laughs> oh, just identity. Okay. Oh, hmm. okay so that's that part. And then that again. I wonder if that's because it's actually starts, it sees it as. Get Selenium identities. So while you're doing that, Rich, your comment uh, made me realize exactly what uh, the level of punnery John was uh, performing. <laughs> For that. Jesus Christ. world is two host is one okay mm. what i'm doing is i'm doing a psyllium identity list on a psyllium agent and we can see these reserved labels right so this traffic the, these labels are reserved and they tell us a little bit more about the traffic and these identities can be used also in network policy and what i'm looking for is i want to understand that traffic that is coming from the world or from outside the cluster into the cluster i see and then I can also distinguish traffic that's coming from the host. I can distinguish traffic that's coming from an unmanaged endpoint, whether it's health traffic from our application, whether it's traffic as part of an init, traffic to or from the remote node, traffic to or from the API server. And these are all fields that I can use inside of, or these are all identities that I can use when doing Hubble Observe. So I'm going to go ahead and put these guys right into our notes so I don't lose them. And then we can refer to them and we can kind of play with Hubble Observe a little bit and see what that would look like over here. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, reserve unmanaged is for a endpoint that is inside the cluster, but is not managed by Cilium. So like if you, you happen to be running in like a dual CNI mode somehow, um, yeah. you know, if you have one coming from like an ENI somewhere inside of uh, an EKS cluster, for instance. Yeah, that, or maybe you like, or maybe you're in a situation where um, you just installed Cilium in a chaining mode, and it has to go through and like restart all the things because now that it's in mm. a managed state. Okay, so let's exact back in here again. Hubble observe dash n default dash dash identity. Ooh. All right, now I think maybe this is coming from. Interesting. Let's try a different experiment just to simplify our, our model. Because Hubble Observe shows me so much traffic, I see all of the traffic happening all the time. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is I want to reduce the amount of noise that I see and just look and look at only the traffic that I care about. What I'm going to do to achieve that is I'm going to do kubectl create space 
echo. Jupyter creates deployment dash n echo image equals an admit echo server. Echo, so there's our inanimate echo server. Mm -hmm. You can call it expose deployment dash in echo, echo, port PD type load. Then Two one six eight two one dot thirty one. Oh, uh, SVC dash and echo. So then I should be able to talk to that one specific thing, three oh three eighty. There we go. So I can do a curl there. And now if I just bring that curl up. To the top, I should only be able to see that traffic coming from here. While I do a Hubble observe, echo dash w dash f. I say, don't you want to be in the Hubble client? Yeah. All right, so it's seeing it coming from 20111. Oh, that makes sense because it's actually from the, it's coming in via the HA proxy instance. Oh, okay. But let's take a closer look at this track. So That's our a lot from, of data. Yeah. So this is the network event stream that we see with Hubble, right? So this is basically what's behind the scenes. If you want to see more information about what's happening, then you can see it. So what I was trying to do was actually see the source traffic reserved world. And I was looking at it correctly, but for some reason I wasn't able to see that. And I'm not sure exactly why. But this answers one of the questions that had that came up earlier. Which was um, does Hubble show accelerate XDP accelerated traffic? And the answer to that is yes. Right, we do still see this traffic. So now what I want to see is why. Let's see if I can actually make this work the way I expected it to work before. Is there a way in Hubble to see that it is that it oh. is XDP traffic? Identity. I don't think so, because from Hubble's perspective, it's just looking at the different trace points and understanding that the traffic went by, not mm. that that traffic was accelerated. Sure, that makes sense. Ah, that's what I was missing. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Also, see you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. All right, so that works. I had to do from identity. Just identity wasn't really doing the job. So from identity sure. to identity, and I can actually see that traffic. Okay. So we're able to see this traffic. The next thing we're going to do, actually, this kind of this could answer your question. Your question was like, is there a way for us to understand that this is XTP accelerated traffic? Mm -hmm. 
because I did see like one of the fields in Hubble is like the interface, right? So it has interface, the ID. You might be able to like, use that to determine which interface it's like look, listening from and all that. I mean, to some degree, yes. But perhaps there's a simpler way. Like, like this is coming to endpoint directly. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> Sadiq is saying hi from Oman, uh, Oman, Dubai. Wow, it is late there. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. No, I think it's not really going to show us that, per se. Nope. No, that might be a fun weekend uh, weekend project to explore Hubble and see if you can expose that. What I can do is this. Mm -hmm. so let's see. Keep it all. Pause dash and echo dash o y. This is landing on worker three, and I'm going to jump into the uh, the psyllium node that's on worker three. Or worker three for that matter. And then from inside of here, I can actually determine some states, right? So I can tell if that if that's accelerated traffic because I have XDP enabled. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. we were that's what we were showing with the verbose piece. Is that here in the cube proxy replacement details? We can see that we're using XDP acceleration native. So anywhere we can use it, we will be mm -hmm. using. It. And then we can also do psyllium BPF. There'll be just... these are the load balancers that are in place. So one of these will be that service for that one of these will be the service that we exposed. So like zero 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 one five one or three one three three one five one three. Mm -hmm. the, the load balancer that is handling node port traffic for that um, for that uh, gold pinger instance. And that's the zero zero three zero three eight zero. That's the load balancer that's handling the the um, the node port piece for ten zero three two two one. And then I think we can also see. Yeah, I don't think there's really a lot more. Mm -hmm. beyond that like we can see the bandwidth manager we can see tunnel we can see lb but like from the perspective of what's happening here it might be useful a useful metric to gather though like which you know how many of your interfaces or your pods or whatever are, are being xtp versus not you know you might be able to like understand why well so it's not gonna it's there's no there's no point at which like if you have xtp enabled in a, mm -hmm. in a native mode then that's the path that we take Mm. Period. Right. So I was I was basing that off of when you said like if it can it will. I was like, well maybe you know how much of it oh. can 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 and cannot, right? Yeah. So it would be like we may not use the XTP acceleration back and forth between the two nodes. So traffic mm -hmm. moving back and forth between new between two nodes. But at the same time, once the traffic lands, that's incoming. If it's coming mm -hmm. in on a node port, it would be accelerated. I'm not sure, sure it's coming in on cluster IP, whether that's accelerated, that might be something worth looking into. Mm -hmm. But we're here to talk about BPF yeah. recording. <laughs> and we can see that we have no psyllium recorder currently in use. And what I wanted to do next was actually show how that would work. Now that we have like the prerequisite configuration in place, we can actually take a look at how this 
functions. So let's take a look and see if we can do a PCAP of this traffic and then show how this would actually work. So I'm going to do Cilium Porter Update Identity, and you can have multiple of these. I'm just going to make ID one. Just like, think of them like slots. You can have multiple things that are doing recording, and you can have multiple of them. I can have multiple files output the, the recording of that data. I'm going to do Kaplan 100 filters. I'm actually just going to parse for the traffic coming from. 192.168.200.1.32 on any port going toward anywhere on any port TCP. This should create a recorder that will look for traffic with source 192.168.200.1 destined for any traffic, like looking at any traffic that's coming in anywhere at the TCP layer. And this will be watching for XDP traffic coming in on this node at the XDP layer. Oh, poop. <laughs> Look at that. All right. Cilium config set. Able recorder. One moment while we turn that on. So Maz asks, if the NIC doesn't support acceleration mode, which other BPF hook Cilium will use to do load balancing? I think it'll just defer back to the route table then, right? TC, actually. It's traffic control. So it's the TC. Ah. So we would see that. Um, and we're uh, actually associating that with the network namespace that the pod is located in, right? So when... Uh, the kubelet creates a pod. The kubelet pod. The kubelet makes a uh, creates a new pod. It also creates a new network namespace. At that mm -hmm. point, we have enough information to be able to allocate an identity to that endpoint. Right. And if you're inside of a if you're inside of a, a Cilium based cluster, you can do kubectl get Cilium endpoints, and you mm -hmm. can see the identity of those pods that that has that exists. So then, yeah, it'll just use the identity to route if, it, if it's not using XDP. And that identity is coupled with that particular endpoint that um, and that network namespace. And, and then we can use a different inspection point or we can use different hooks to, to manipulate that traffic. The most common one we use is TC. But we can also use like socket. Um, so we can, we can also operate in a socket LB mode where we're actually able to see that traffic at the socket layer and interact with it from that perspective. So when somebody makes, so when an application is, if you're like, you have two pods and you're doing a curl from one pod to the other pod, right? As soon as that curl starts up, you're going to see a connect call happen, right? At the, at the Linux kernel API. Mm -hmm. When that connect call happens, we can say, okay, well, hey, that curl is happening between two endpoints on the same node. And since those two endpoints are on the same node, we can use effectively, uh, XD, we can use like socket layer, uh, load balancing to allow for connections back and forth between these two points without having to move back and forth between user spaces. Mm -hmm, that right. means if, we, you, if you were doing a TCP dump for traffic moving back and forth between those two pods, you would see traffic like start up. You would see the TCP handshake happen, but then you mm -hmm. wouldn't see any of the content happening back and forth between those two. Makes sense. All right. So we have created a recorder. A recorder. No, we haven't done that yet. So let's do oh. it. So kick it out, get pause, dash in, good system. Worker zero two, kick it out, get pods. Go dash O. Wide, it's worker zero three.
Here is our recorder creation. Mm -hmm. And now we got a recorder. There we go. Selenium PDF recorder. This recorder. Yep. So let's generate some traffic. Oh wait, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> because we're we're coming from two hundred one point one, and we're recording for two hundred point one. So yeah. Whoops. Yep. So you want to hit your ATA proxy, right? If I recall, two hundred point one. Coming from two hundred point one. Should be coming from two hundred one point one. Oh okay. We got a bunch of curls in there. So then, if we do Cilium BPF record of us, we should be able to see it. There's another cool inside of inside of Cilium that's called Cilium Monitor. We can do from You can also do a type, type recorder, monitor dash T. Mm -hmm. Probably health check. Okay, so we are actually seeing traffic come in and hit that recorder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the output of the recorder. So now we have the option of actually leveraging Hubble to gather up that PCAP. So now that we see that that traffic is happening, then the next thing we can do is we can do Hubble record. We're looking for two one dot one. And then we'll be able to see from here, which is basically just leveraging the local Hubble command line tool inside of the Cilium agent to watch for this traffic. So now we're seeing the traffic go by and we're writing a PCAP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I do a bunch of curls, we can see a bunch more data go by. I don't we're still seeing some, right? But like if right. I generate, we can see a bunch more. If I hit Control C, then this is our PCAP that's been put onto the host at this layer. Which is so much more convenient than doing a TCP dump command and trying to figure out exactly which ones, like where you need to go from to like all the flags and everything. So look at TC pick, see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. 
P dash Y P dash R R run silly and Hubble. Caps. There you go. Whoa. Yeah. So this is a way of looking at a PCAP and seeing what's happening at that layer, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing our gets. We're seeing the content of it. We're seeing the connection back and forth. We're seeing the sins in this in the synx, the health checks and that sort of stuff. But we're also seeing our queries, right? So this is us yeah. doing a get of the HTTPS from 200 to the 201, 31. And we're seeing all of this traffic basically being represented at the packet layer right from inside of our XDP layer. So all of this packet data is available to us. Which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. For data that would normally be obfuscated because it, you know, ignores all the layers that the normal tools work at. The fact that you can just easily set up a recorder really fast and you're like, okay, I, I, I need to figure out what's going on here. You can just record this information. I think that's pretty neat. Well, that's our SSH command. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Sirs, what is it? Interesting. This layer, we're still seeing the PCAP. That's interesting. That is interesting. Because we're coming, we're coming from this and we're going direct. Oh, I see. What's interesting about this is that we're still seeing the traffic, but we're seeing the traffic after the load balancing. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because that is the load balancer IP address. That's interesting. So probably we're looking at the LXC interface here, which I guess would make sense. But if we were to look at the E0 interface instead of, you see how this TCP dump command is actually doing on e and, and on any interface. Mm -hmm. If I watch at the E0 interface, there you go. I guess I still see it. Am I going to the right host? No. I'm not. <laughs> That's why this is happening. Because this is actually a node port that is being balanced back and forth between hosts. Mm -hmm. You'll get pod session echo dash o wide. Three. So if you go directly to those. Three is two one thirty three. Mm -hmm. So we see the traffic come in mm -hmm. from two oh one one. It's destined for ten oh three two oh one. And so we're seeing it after the decision is being made, but mm -hmm. we're still seeing, but we're still seeing the traffic. So it's hard for us to understand that that translation is happening. 
Right. Whereas, like, I think if we see... Yeah. I do dash R caps hubble. this layer we're still seeing the same information interesting well yeah. i think i might take us take us back and like see what i see from that perspective because i'm definitely surprised that i'm able to detect this at this layer i wonder if this is a function of i wonder if this is a function of the fact that it's like a virtual nic driver mm -hmm. i was i was just saying the same thing like if that's still being exposed to the uh, that layer of the kernel. Yeah, because what's happening at the XTP layer still doesn't seem to be showing me the mapping between this incoming packet and the outside packet. I can't see the, the decision that's being made. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, this has been kind of an interesting troubleshooting <laughs> situation. Like we've learned a lot about like how this is happening and like mm -hmm. what, what works and the kind of environment that had to be set up to make this work. Um, I hope that at least some of you who are using Cilium can use some of these tools to kind of understand a little bit more what's uh, happening at the, at the traffic layer. One of the things that I can show you that also might help us understand the decision being made is Cilium Monitor. Because then you can actually see, I think you can actually see the traffic Do our curl again. Coming in. This. It'll get slim endpoints dash in echo. Cilium monitor related to endpoint ID 3096. We will only see that traffic. And if I do a curl, you can see the original IP is 2011. And we can see the destination IP is 10.03.201. And then we can see 10.3.0.1 netting back. But we still don't see the decision. We can see it coming from this identity 5.8.1.1 and going to world. We can see world going into 5.8.1.1, but we still don't see the decision. What would the decision look like? ID, the idea would be that we'd be able to see the decision from the, you know, like how, probably CT, yeah, CT, ah, no, endpoint identifier, 5811. These are the decisions that we're making. Mm -hmm. Sending the traffic to 10.03.3. Let's do a grep for 
So that's a TCP in and a TCP out mm -hmm. for connections back and forth between 2.1.1 and 10.0.3.0.1. But still not the... I'm trying to find where we can actually see the decision that's being made back and forth between the traffic coming in, destined for which healthy endpoint do we pick, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like right now we can see which one because it's the only thing that's in the output. But we can't see... I guess that would make sense. Your, your there's, point, only one, there's no decision to make. Yeah. Your point is valid because like, how would it look? It would look like this. You would see that the translation had already happened, but you wouldn't right. be able to see that that decisions were being made. You'd just be able to mm -hmm. see what the decision was. Yeah. So that makes more sense. Well, I'm glad we could walk through it. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me. Like I said, next week, tune in to EPF Day and see us hosting that. That should be super fun. There's lots of great content to cover there. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I EVP of Summer is going to be a lot of fun. I think there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff going on. So I'll definitely uh, tune in virtually because I'll be here. Here in the great Pacific okay. Northwest. And I th what time is it in the U.S.? So in the evening, it'll be the evening over there. Mm -hmm. Take a look and find out. Yeah. Bio. And you can click on the UPF Summit. And then the schedule Pacific time. It'll be in the morning. Oh, very nice. It goes basically from morning till about mid-afternoon. Oh, yeah, that's perfect for me. But yeah. Uh, EBFS Summit will be a lot of fun. There will not be an echo next week because of it. Uh, all of next week is <laughs> one giant EBPF Summit <laughs> or one giant echo, right? Although we have used echo before to do like the CTF broadcast. Um, so oh, sure. I can see that. I guess we'll see how that goes. But yeah. one way or the other, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and a great week. And thank you so much, Nick, for joining me. And thank you yeah. everybody else in the audience for being here. And making the jump with me through this weird technical difficulty that we had. <laughs> this is a really weird technical day. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for having me. I learned a whole lot. This is a, a really cool piece of technology. This is actually an area that I, I'd like to explore again on another episode, like just diving back into this. Um, yeah. With a, a little bit a of a series uh, of like life of a packet. And this is actually part of that, but I yeah. think that, uh, yeah, I, I hope that wasn't too distractible. You know? <laughs> I hope I wasn't too distracted. <laughs> Ah, it is what it is. You know. All right. <laughs> sometimes you have to watch weird things like this a few times before they stick. You know. But, yeah. Exactly. No, I, I, I think even I found that people really uh, tend to like troubleshooting sessions like this. Just really see how, like, how you think, how I think, and kind of what you can do to like take a look at all the little bits and pieces. I'm doing this is my last thought before I go because we have right. to, we have to shut down soon. But <laughs> I'm doing an I'm doing a um a uh, a uh, uh, KubeCon talk on mm -hmm. perspective. And in that KubeCon talk, I'm talking about learning something technical that is new to me. In this case, it was learning how to solve the Rubik's Cube and how there are so many uh, points in in this journey, which are almost directly related to the way that we we learn how to code or we learn how to do anything technical, right? Mm -hmm. Like to the point where like, I love watching other people solve the Rubik's Cube. Oh yeah. I, because it's it's fascinating to now that I know basically how it works, right? Watching somebody else do it is really informative. Mm -hmm. I can really understand a more about like how they're they're thinking through it. It's like watching somebody else solve a technical challenge, like yeah. this whole episode, for example. Because <laughs> <laughs> right? so you can like really learn a lot about you can take you can you can really stand on the shoulders of giants and learn so much more about everything else. Just when you get, you know, once you've built enough intuition to understand kind of the scope of the problem, to really take your understanding to the next level, being able to see other people work through that same set of challenges really helps you like open your brain to like, oh, wow, I never thought about that. I never thought about, I might, I didn't make the intuitive leap that XDP was going to do this if I did that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, you know, that's what I love about it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. Thank you sure. so much. Great, great host. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Rain the exit seconds. Bye. <laughs>